Morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We're going to continue in our reading and discussion of the book, A Woman Rides a Beast by Dave Hunt. We're currently in the chapter entitled Seducer of Souls. And we'll continue where we left off uh, last Friday, uh, backing up just one paragraph for continuity purposes. The last paragraph of uh, this particular section, you'll find at the middle of page 180, It says, the numerous divisions within the Roman Catholic Church range all the way from art conservatism to beliefs and practices of priests and nuns deeply involved in Hinduism, Buddhism, to Hans Kung's liberalism. The latter is so far from Rome's official party line that in 1979 the Vatican revoked his status as theologian, yet he remains a powerful uh, influence within the Roman Catholic Church. Or take Father Matthew Fox, silenced for one year by the Vatican, but vocal thereafter, with views that could only be called pagan and New Age. Expelled from the Dominican Order for insubordination and not excommunicated from the Church for his gross heresies, Fox has since become an Episcopalian. A wide range of other theologians and clergy remain in the church, from Mary Knoll priests and nuns advocating Marxism and liberation theology, to to the Society of St. Pius X zealots, who are scandalized by John Paul II's ecumenism. Okay, there's where we ended up Friday, still talking about the real divisions within the Roman Catholic Church. You know, we're led to believe we're led to believe that the Roman Catholic Church is so united in its belief system that, uh, and then that as evidence of its infallibility as the one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church outside of which there is no salvation, which in fact is a lie. The Roman Catholic Church is fractured into many different pieces all rival factions seeking their particular influence over the papacy and trying to change the church, change the theology of the church. And it is truly confusion. Okay? Confusion. That's its Babylonian roots. Confusion. Now Dave Hunt continues with the next portion of this chapter entitled The Great Schism. He says there have been at least as many divisions among Roman Catholics throughout the centuries as among Protestants, and there still are to this day. Some of these disagreements were fought with sword and spear. Consider, for example, the Great Schism when France and Italy struggled for possession of the lucrative papacy. In 1378, Pope Urban VI, the Neapolitan, became Pope. Trying to effect some much-needed reform, Urban excommunicated the cardinals who had purchased their benefices, Dimini. Now, it was a well-intentioned but politically foolish move, as the historian von Gollinger explains, quote, Dimini had long been the daily bread of the Roman Curia and the breath of its life. Without Simony, the machine must come to a standstill. And instantly fall to pe- or instantly fall to pieces. The cardinals had, for their own point of view, ample ground for insisting on the impossibility of subsisting without it. They accordingly revolted from Urban and elected Clement the Seventh, a man after their own heart. And thus it came to pass that in 1378 to 1409, Western Christendom was divided into two obediences. So because of the the uh, the, the uh, war over simony, the papacy was split in two, there being two popes. And in 19, excuse me, 1409, Pisa was the scene of a synod from all Europe that was called to heal the breach. It was the first time in 300 years that those attending such a gathering dared to speak openly and vote freely. 
There was a sense of relief, even of triumph, when the two reigning popes, Gregory the Twelfth and Benedict the Thirteenth, were deposed as heretics, and a third pope, Alexander V, was elected. Of course, neither of the two popes yielded to their synod's decision. Now there were three, quote-unquote, vicars of Christ, instead of a mere two, just as there had been 350 years before. The situation lasted from 1409 to 1415 A.D. Could it be that one of the abominations to which this woman in John's vision would give birth was a man claiming to be the vicar of Christ? And even worse, three men each claiming to be Christ's true and only representative on the earth, each damning those who followed either of the other two? Catherine of Siena, who persuaded Gregory the the Eleventh, seventh of of the Avignon popes, to return to Rome, is recognized today as a Catholic saint. She was a staunch supporter of Urban the Sixth, but he is shown on the list, the lists as an anti-pope. The worst abominations. Just before her death. Catherine, who had lengthy trances in which she allegedly saw heaven, purgatory, and hell, received permission from God, so she said, to allow her, quote, to bear the punishment of all the sins of the world, unquote. Yet Christ's death had already paid the full penalty for sin. Was she excommunicated as a heretic for sex blasphemy? No, she was so admired for her quote-unquote sacrifice that the Roman Catholic Church made her a saint. Five hundred years later, the Church would accept the claim that the sufferings, as evidenced by the stigmata and bleeding in the hands, feet, and the side where Christ was pierced, endured for fifty years by a monk named Pedro P- uh, Padre Pio, were were also in payment for the sins of the world. Peel claimed that more spirits of the dead than the living persons vi- uh, than living persons visited him in his monastery cell. The spirits came to thank him for praying for their sins with his sufferings, so they could be released from purgatory and go to heaven. Other monks testified that they heard multitudes of voices talking with. Padre Pio at night. The Bible, however, repeatedly assures us that Christ suffered the full penalty for sin. Quote, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 and Colossians chapter 1 verse 14. There's nothing left for sinners to pay in order to receive the pardon offered by God's grace. The debt has been paid in full. Quote, it is finished. Unquote. Christ cried in triumph just before he died upon the cross. To suggest otherwise is the most serious heresy. John the Baptist hailed Christ as, quote, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. See John chapter 1 verse 29. All others, including P.O. et al., being sinners, for all have sinned, see Romans chapter 3, verse 23, would have to die for their own sins and therefore could not also pay for the sins of another person. Peter declared that Christ once and for all time suffered for sins, the just, that is the sinless one, for us, the unjust, that he might bring us to God, First Peter 3.18. Yet Catherine of Siena and Pedro Pio and other suffering saints are revered and prayed to by millions of Catholics, including the the current Pope, for having suffered for the sins of others. They are greater than Christ in the sense that his suffering leave good Catholics still in purgatory, whereas Padre Pio's suffering releases multitudes to heaven. Vatican II declared that believers have always, quote, carried their crosses to make expiation for their own sins and the sins of others. 
to help their brothers obtain salvation from God, unquote. Such blasphemy is one of the abominations to which Roman, the Roman Catholic Church has given birth and which she still nurtures today. Can there be any greater abomination than teaching that sinners for whom Christ paid the full penalty of sin need yet to, quote, make expiation for their own sins and the sins of others, unquote? <clears throat> Under the subtitle, Idols of Thy Abominations, Dave writes, In the Bible, the word abomination is a spiritual term associated with idolatry. God condemned Israel for, quote, the idols of thy abominations, unquote. See Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 36. Occult practices are also called abominations, along with illicit and perverted sex. Since the woman astride the beast is, quote, the mother of harlots and abominations, unquote, it seems clear that these evil practices rooted in Babel will, under Antichrist, characterize the world religion which this woman represents. She is called the mother of these things because she has fostered and encouraged them. The description fits exactly both the history and the present practice of the Roman Catholic Church. The biblical prohibition against making images for religious purposes and bowing down before them, and, God ab and God's abhorrence of this pagan practice is clearly set forth in the second of the Ten Commandments and in numerous other passages of Scripture. For example, quote, Ye shall make you no idols nor graven image to bow down unto it. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord. Unquote. Leviticus 26.1, Deuteronomy 27.15. Yet Vatican II recommends images in the church and says that they are to be venerated by the faithful. In Catholic churches and cathedrals around the world, one sees the faithful on their knees in front of images of this sort or that saint, most often Mary. The second of the Ten Commandments that God gave to Israel states, quote, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth be thee. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Exodus chapter 20, verse 40, uh, 4 and 5, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. How does the Roman Catholic Church get around this clear prohibition? She does worse than ignore it. She literally hides it from the people. The Ten Commandments shown in the Catholic Catechisms leave out the Second Commandment, prohibiting images, and divide the last one, prohibiting covetousness, into two. It is a flagrant rejection of the clear command by God. Moreover, that rejection is dishonestly covered up by pretending the command doesn't exist. It is a deliberate deception practiced upon the members of the church, most of whom know nothing of the Bible except what the clergy tell them. When Emperor Leo III issued an edict from Constantinople calling for forcible baptism of Jews, he was praised. But when in 726 A.D. he demanded that all images be broken, there was a great outcry from citizens and clergy. Pope Gregory II claimed that images were not worshipped, but reverenced. The truth slipped out, however, in his letter to the emperor. Quote, but as for the statue of St. Peter himself, with all the kingdoms of the West, uh, which all the kingdoms of the West esteem as a god on earth, the whole West would take a terrible revenge if it were destroyed, unquote. A bloody war was fought around Ravenna over this issue, and a synod in Rome excommunicated all who dared attack the images. Christians had not used images until Constantine became the de facto head of the church. The door that was open to paganism at that time has never been shut. The Roman Catholic Church attempted to accommodate the pagans joining it by retaining their idols under 
Christian names. That practice is still part of Santeria, Voodoo, etc. today. Catholic apologists insist that veneration is uh, is not of the image itself, but of the quote-unquote saint that it represents. Yet Pope John Paul II openly promotes the pagan belief that images have power. Recently, at St. Peter's Basilica, the Pope declared, quote, a mysterious presence of the transcendent prototype seems, as it were, to be transferred to the sacred image. The devout contemplation of such an image thus appears as a real and concrete path of purification of the soul of the believer, because the image itself, blessed by the priest, can, in a certain sense, by analogy with the sacraments, actually be considered a channel of divine grace, unquote. Such idolatry the Bible repeatedly condemns as spiritual adultery or fornication. Rome is the mother of harlots in this way, in this way as well, having led untold millions into idolatry. Now, under the subtitle, Salvation for Sale, we're going to talk about indulgences now, a subject that is familiar to my regular listeners. The Roman Catholic Church has been in the business of selling salvation to the naive with with much of her great wealth accumulated from that source. And she does this in the name of Christ, who offers salvation as a free gift. He told his disciples, quote, Freely ye have received, freely give. Unquote. See Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. There could be no greater abomination than selling salvation. Yet Rome has never repented of this evil, but continues similar practice to this very day. Under Pope Leo X, who reigned from 1513 to 1521, who cursed and excommunicated Martin Luther, specific prices were published by the Roman Chancery to be paid to the church for absolution from each imaginable crime. Even murder had its price. For example, a deacon guilty of murder could be absolved for 20 crowns. The quote-unquote anointed malefactor, as they were called, once pardoned in this way by the church, could not be prosecuted by civil authorities. Leo's sale of salvation was nothing new. Two hundred years earlier, Pope John the Twenty-Second, who reigned from 1316 to 1334, had done the very same thing, setting a price for every crime from murder to incest to sodomy. The more Catholics sinned, the richer the Roman Catholic Church became. Similar fundraising schemes had been in operation for years. Pope Innocent VIII, who reigned from 1484 to 1492, for example, had granted the 20-year Butterbrief indulgence. For a certain sum, one could purchase the privilege of eating favorite dishes during Lent and at other times of fasting. It was a way to be credited with fasting while indulging oneself in the richest foods. The people believed that the popes had such power. After all, wasn't whatever the quote-unquote vicars of Christ bound or loosed on earth, similarly bound and loosed in heaven? The proceeds from this enterprising scheme built the bridge over the Elbe. Pope Julius III, who reigned from 1550 to 1555, renewed this indulgence for a handsome fee for another 20 years after he came to office. Pope Leo X tore down Constantine's Basilica and built St. Peter's, largely with monies paid by people who thought they were thereby gaining forgiveness for sins and entrance into heaven. That magnificent structure stands as one more piece of evidence that Rome is the mother of abominations. As Giovanni de' Medici, Leo had made an abbot at age seven for his first communion and a, uh, for his first communion and a cardinal at age thirteen. Though he was the youngest cardinal at the time, 
Pope Benedict the Ninth ascended the papal throne, the papal throne at age eleven. Imagine an eleven-year-old solemnly pronouncing forgiveness of sins as Christ's one true representative on earth. It was Pope Leo X who commissioned the Dominican friar Tetzel to sell indulgences, which it was promised would free those in purgatory or release the purchaser, if bought in his own name, from having to spend any time in that intermediate place of torment. Tetzel's infamous sales pitch went something like this, quote, As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs, unquote. How could anyone be so naive as to believe that the forgiveness of sin for which Christ had to endure the full wrath of God upon the cross could be purchased with money? This quote-unquote God of Catholicism, who moves in response to whatever regulations a corrupt church invents, is clearly not the God of the Bible. It was this particular abomination of selling salvation that scandalized Martin Luther and sparked the Protestant Reformation. Well-meaning Protestants, wanting to believe the best, imagine that Roman Catholicism has rid itself of past abominations, including indulgences. But Charles Colson's book, entitled The Body, contains examples of such incorrect information. Though the book eloquently speaks much truth, it erroneously presents Roman Catholicism as biblical Christianity and calls for union therewith on the part of evangelicals. Colson writes, quote, The Reformers, for example, assailed the corrupt practices of indulgences. Today, they, meaning indulgences, are gone, save for the modern-day equivalent practices by some unscrupulous televangelist hucksters, ironically mostly Protestants, who promise healing and blessing for contributions, unquote. We endorse his condemnation of the, quote, unscrupulous television hucksters, unquote, but wonder at his incorrect interpretation of Rome. A major document of Vatican Council II devotes 17 pages to explaining indulgences and how to obtain them and excommunicates and damns any who deny that the church has the right to grant indulgences today for salvation. The rules are complex and ludicrous as well as abominable. Try to imagine God honoring such regulations as granting certain indulgences, quote, only on set days appointed by the Holy See, or that of a plenary indulgence applicable only to the dead can be gained in all churches on November 2nd. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in a temple on Temple Mount? 
Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone. Absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Back from the break, you're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. Now, Dave Hunt says, we endorse Chuck Colson's condemnation of the quote-unquote unscrupulous television hucksters, unquote, but wonder at his incorrect interpretation of Rome. A major document of Vatican II devotes 17 pages to explaining indulgences and how to obtain them and excommunicates and damns any who deny that the Roman Catholic Church has the right to grant indulgences today for salvation. The rules are complex and ludicrous as well as abominable. Try to imagine God honoring such regulations as granting certain indulgences, quote, only on set days appointed by the Holy See, unquote, or that a, quote, plenary indulgence applicable only to the dead can be gained in all churches on November 2nd, etc. I wonder why they chose November 2nd. Anybody have an idea? I do. The entire teaching on indulgences denies the sufficiency of Christ's redemptive sacrifice for sins upon the cross. Some ancient indulgences even remain in force today. A recent notice inside the publication known as Inside the Vatican reminded Roman Catholics that on August 28th and 29th of 1994, an unusual opportunity for obtaining a special indulgence would occur. Quote, Pope Celestine V gave a holy door to the Cathedral of Maria Calamaggio in his bull of the 29th of September, 1294, to obtain this quote-unquote pertinanza indulgence. It's necessary to be in the cathedral between 6 p.m. on the 28th of August and 6 p.m. on the 29th of August, to truly repent of one's sins and to confess and go to Mass and communion within eight days of the visit. The holy door is open every year, but this year, 1994, is the 700th anniversary of the Bull of Pardon. Go there, unquote. Warning. Reformation ahead. Inside the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church to which Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses were relics, including an alleged lock of the Virgin Mary's hair, offering two million years in indulgences to those venerating them according to prescribed rules. Never has the Roman Catholic Church apologized for having led multitudes astray in this manner. And how does one apologize to souls now in hell for having sold them 
a bogus, quote, ticket to heaven, unquote. For both ingenuity and infamy, no money-grabbing scheme of the past or of today's unscrupulous television hucksters even comes close to the sale of indulgences. It provided much cash for the popes at the time of the Reformation. In A.D. 593, Pope Gregory I had had first uh, proposed the unbiblical but ultimately very, very profitable idea that there was a place called purgatory in which the spirits of the dead suffered in order to be purged of their sins and fully delivered from, quote, the debt of eternal punishment, unquote. This fabrication was declared to be a church dogma by the Council of Florence in 1439 and remains an important part of Roman Catholicism today. It was not such abominable heresies, however, that divided Roman Catholics. All seemed content with the promise that the church would somehow get them to heaven no matter how repugnant to common sense and justice the methods were. As Chamberlain has said, quote, the eye of faith was blind to the incidental discrepancies, unquote. It was the division caused by the rival popes, each claiming to be in charge of the machinery of salvation, that stirred the church to action. By deposing all three rivals uh, who each claimed to be the so-called vicar of Christ, and then appointing a new pope, Martin V, the Council of Constance reunited the church. Many bishops were convinced that a reformation was desperately needed. To move the church toward reformation, Constance decreed that there should be another ecumenical council each ten years. Pope Martin V dutifully, quote, summoned the council in 1423 to meet first at Pavia, then at Siena. But the moment any signs of an attempt to reform manifested themselves, he dissolved it, quote, on account of the fewness of those present, unquote. However, shortly before his death, he summoned the new council to meet at Basel. Martin V's successor, Eugenius IV, could not avoid carrying out the duty he had inherited from his predecessor, to which he, he was already pledged in conclave, unquote. The struggle for supremacy between the popes and the councils. Eugenius ordered the council disbanded almost immediately upon a pretext. But the assembly refused, and a contest with the pope began. At first, with the backing of the general populace of Europe and King Sigismund, in vain the pope excommunicated the prelates involved. Support for reform poured into the council from kings, princes, bishops, prelates, and universities. Under pressure, the pope was forced to give the council his full sanction, an acknowledgment once again of the superiority of council over pope, which Pope Pius IX would manage to reverse at Vatican Council I. The council deposed Eugenius, calling him, quote, a notorious disturber of peace and unity of God's church, a simoniac, a perjurer, an incorrigible man, a schismatic, an apostate from the faith, an obstinate heretic, a squanderer of the church rights and property, incapable of and harmful to the administration of the Roman pontificate, unquote. Yet his name remains on today's official lists of the vicars of Christ. With great courage, the council declared, quote, All ecclesiastical appointments shall be made according to the canons of the church. All simony shall cease. All priests, whether the highest or lowest rank, shall put away their concubines. And whoever within two months of this decree neglects its demands, shall be deprived of his office, though he be the bishop of Rome. The Pope shall neither demand nor receive any fees for ecclesiastical offices. From now on, a Pope shall think not of this world's treasures, but only of those of the world to come." Unquote. That machine 
or rather, that medicine, excuse me, proved too strong, and the tide of opinion turned against the council. The people wanted reformation, but not that much reformation. And the last thing the Pope and the Curia wanted was to be required to live as true Christians with a council making certain they did. Pope Eugenius summoned his own council at Florence, deposed and anathematized the members of Basil, quote, laid Basil under interdict, excommunicated the municipal court, and required everyone to plunder the merchants who were bringing their wares to the city, because it is written, quote, the righteous, the righteous hath spoiled the ungodly, unquote. The Pope then bribed King Frederick with a hundred thousand florins, quote, together with the imperial crown, assigned tithes to him from all the German benefices, and gave full power to his confessor to give him twice a plenary absolution from all sins, unquote. Such is the abominable manner in which the popes dispense their favors, including forgiveness of sins. Let me tell you, popes of Rome still wield that kind of power, and that's how they control the kings and presidents and queens and potentates of the world. Still, the world has not learned the lesson of history or of Bible prophecy. He says the Council of Basel could not compete with the power and wealth of the Pope. Eugenius now had the backing he needed. Von Dollinger comments, quote, The victory of Eugenius was complete. When on his deathbed he, re- he received the homage of the German ambassadors, the event was celebrated, February 7, 1447, in Rome, with the ringing of bells and bonfires. Even the slight concessions the Pope had made to the Germans, he thereupon recalled in secret bulls, In 1443, an anonymous German Catholic, in mourning for his church, seemed to echo the very vision of, that God had given John in the, in the book of Revelation in chapter 17. Quote, The Roman harlot has so many paramours drunk with the wine of her fornications that the bride of Christ, the church, and the council representing her scarcely receive the loyal devotion of one among a thousand. As he died, having triumphed over the council and Germany, Eugenius cried in agony of conscience, How much better were it for thy soul's salvation hadst thou never become cardinal and pope, unquote. The next pope, Nicholas V, who, or excuse me, Nicholas V, who reigned from 1447 to 1455, voided Eugenius's decrees against the Council of Basel, yet both popes remain on the official list of popes today. It was the last chance for the papacy to be reformed, but it would not happen. In only a short while, the curious, diligent forgers were at work once again producing more false documents to prove the Pope's infallibility and dominance over all. The cor- <clears throat> Under the subtitle, Corruption of the Era, Dave Hunt continues, he says, Rome's domin- uh, dominance, Rome's dominance of church and world for more than a thousand years through excommunication, torture, and death had led to corruption of such proportions that even the secular world recoiled in shame and horror. The cry resounded throughout Christendom for a reformation of the church. All knew, however, that it was impossible as long as the court of Rome remained what it was. Quote, There every mischief is fostered and protected, and thence it spreads, but there, unless a miracle, there is no hope for reformation. Unquote. Among the popes who followed Nicholas on Peter's alleged throne were some whose evil was beyond imagination. Von Dollinger says of Pope, this, uh, Pope Paul II, Sixtus IV, 
Innocent the Eighth and Alexander the Sixth, that each tried, quote, to exceed the vices of his predecessor, unquote. One contemporary said that Paul II had, quote, made the papal chair into a sewer by his debaucheries, unquote. Pilgrims who went to Rome with high hopes returned disillusioned, just like Martin Luther, to declare that, quote, in the metropolis of Christendom, speaking of Rome, and in the bosom of the great mother and mistress of all churches, the clergy, with scarcely an exception, keep concubines, unquote. And the church made a profit from it. Pope Sixtus IV, who reigned from 1471 to 1484, who had licensed Rome's brothels for an annual fee and taxed the clergy for their mistresses, invented an even more ingenious method of filling the church coffers. It would be used by the popes after him to full advantage. Sixtus decided that he, as Christ's vicar, could apply indulgences to the dead as well as to the living. It was a novel idea which no one had thought of before, and one which turned out to be incredibly profitable. What surviving relative could refuse to purchase the release of a deceased mother, father, aunt, or uncle, or child from the tortures of purgatory? And, of course, the richer the living relatives were, the more it invariably cost to transfer the deceased from purgatory to heaven. One marvels that anyone would take the word of such an evil pope. But Sixtus was no worse than many others, and after all, evil or not, he was Christ's vicar and the successor of Peter. Was he not? Again, Chamberlain put it so well, quote, No lay monarch, no matter how powerful or virtuous, could hope to attract to himself the deep instinct instinctive reverence than men felt for the successor of St. Peter, no matter how unworthy, unquote. The few bold souls, such as Savonarola of Florence, who dared to criticize Rome's abominations, were consigned to the flames for their zeal. Now on to the Council of Trent, Dave Hunt says, Such was the state of the Roman Catholic Church at the time of the Protestant Reformation. Remember, Luther and Calvin were devout Roman Catholics. There were no Protestants. That word had not yet been invented. Multitudes had been crying for Reformation for at least 200 years. No one, however, Calvin and Martin Luther included, wanted to leave the Roman Catholic Church. They desired to see it it reformed from within. Furious at the challenge to their power, the popes would have consigned Luther and Calvin to the flames. But unable to get their hands on them because of the protection afforded by certain German princes, the hierarchy threw them summarily out of the church, sick to death with the arrogant despotisms of the papacy, with its oppression and slaughter of any who would now bow, who would not bow to its imperious demands. Multitudes followed Martin Luther and John Calvin, and the other reformer, the Reformation leaders, out of the church. Giddy with the first gasping breaths of spiritual freedom they had ever drawn. Suddenly Protestantism, this upstart clamor of heresy, was thriving and on the march everywhere. Pope Paul III saw his empire dwindling, and his influence over kings coming to an end. A despotic Renaissance Pope who had, quote, bestowed the red hat on his nephews, aged 14 and 17, and promoting them despite their notorious immorality, unquote. Pope Paul III acted decisively on two fronts. He convened a council in Trent in northern Italy that would condemn the Protestant Reformation theologically, and he went to work behind the scenes to organize a holy war that was intended to militarily wipe Protestantism from the face of the earth in Christ's name. Rome's popularity was at a low ebb when the Council of Trent met in, in excuse me, 1545, 
to consider its response to the menace of Protestantism which threatened the Church and much of Europe. There were still many clergy within the Roman Catholic Church who realized the need for a Reformation and hoped that the Council of Trent would bring it about, thereby making it possible to welcome those who had left the Church back into its fold. The Pope and his Curia, however, had other plans. The opening speech at the Council by Bishop Coriolano Martorano <clears throat> encouraged those who hoped for reform. Unfortunately, very few so minded were present, for the Pope had stacked the deck with his own men. Von Dollinger describes that stirring oration, quote, The picture he, Martorano, drew of the Italian cardinals and bishops, their bloodthirsty cruelty, their avarice, their pride, and the devastation they had wrought of the church was perfectly shocking. An unknown writer who was described, for, uh, who, who has described this first sitting in a letter to a friend thinks Luther himself never spoke more severely, unquote. In fact, this lone cry for a return to genuine Christianity was followed by a chorus supported the, uh, supporting the very evil which Martirano had exposed. The Council of Trent, controlled by Italians, was to prove itself incapable of facing the facts. When once again a non-Italian delegate dared to bring up charges that, def that reflected badly upon the papacy, the Italian bishops shouted, stamped their feet, and cried that this, quote, accursed wretch must not speak he should at once be brought to trial, unquote. The, quote, freedom of speech, unquote, at Trent was similar to what it would be 325 years later in Rome at Vatican Council I. A famous eyewitness wrote shortly after the council opened that nothing beneficial was to be hoped for from the monstrous bishops attending. There was nothing episcopal about them except their long robes. They had become bishops through royal favor, through solicitation, through purchase in Rome, through criminal arts, or after long years spent in the Curia, unquote. They, quote, must all be deposed, unquote, if Trent was to produce anything worthy, but that was impossible. Another contemporary, Pallavicini, wrote, quote, the Italian bishops knew of no other aim than the upholding of the apostolic see and its greatness. They thought that in working for its interests, they showed themselves at once good Italians and good Christians, unquote. Now Dave's going to talk a little bit about the Catholic and Protestant wars. He says, not satisfied with damning the Protestants theologically, the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent containing more than 100 anathemas against Protestant beliefs, Pope Paul III wanted to destroy them physically. He offered the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V of Spain 1,100,000 ducats, 12,000 infantry, 500 horses, if he would turn his full force against the quote-unquote heretics. The Catholic emperor was only too happy to have a reason to bring the rival Protestant princes of Germany into subjection and, quote, to crush Protestantism and give to his realm a unified Catholic faith that would, he thought, strengthen and facilitate his own government, unquote. Nearly ten years of war across Europe ensued. Pope Paul III, quote, issued a bull excommunicating all who should resist Charles and offering liberal indulgences to all who should aid him, unquote. After heavy losses on both sides and much treachery among rival rulers, the Protestants remained strong enough to force the emperor into a compromise. Will Durant explains the settlement that created the state churches which still exist in Europe today. Quote, in order to, to permit peace among and within the states, each prince was to choose between Roman Catholicism and Lutheranism. 
all his subjects were to accept, quote, his religion whose realm, unquote, it was. And those who did not like it were to emigrate. There was no pretense on either side to toleration. The principle which the Reformation had upheld in the youth of its rebellion, the right of private judgment, was as completely rejected by the Protestant leaders as by the Catholics. The Protestants now agreed with Charles and the Pope that unity of religious belief was indispensable to social order and peace. The princes were to banish dissenters instead of burning them. The real victor was not freedom of worship, but freedom of the princes. Each became, like Henry VIII of England, a supreme head of the church, whether Catholic or Protestant, in his territory, with the exclusive right to appoint the clergy and the men who should define the obligatory faith. We've run out of time. We'll finish this uh, quote tomorrow on the broadcast. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Again, the title of the book, A Woman Rides a Beast by Dave Hunt. We'll pick it up where we left off tomorrow. We'll see you then. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border 
crossthborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossthborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthborder.org.